think um, Anastasia, which I was doing yesterday, is fantastic as organisers of this uh, on the event like this to see everybody engaging so deeply. Um, we've just got to balance that with our um, session times that to get through um, the material that we want to bring to you. So, um, yeah, punctuality would be awesome. Um, <laughs> on that note, um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our second you know, speaker, uh, Professor Alistair Woodward. And uh, he's going to be speaking to us on the, um, the adaptation or, or not um, in the face of climate change. Alistair. Civilizations. 
all occurred during this period following the last ice age. It was a period of warmth, of, of rising temperatures, which were probably, was probably one of the most important factors of hot thing, the appearance of agriculture, and with agriculture followed a cascade of effects uh, that we very well described um, in places. So the graph here um, shows, it's a bit of a cartoon really, it's a, a summary of what happened over, these period, over this period. And there are two things that I'd like you to take note. One is, um, this shows global average temperature. It varied during this period, but over a relatively narrow range, basically plus or minus one degree. At the same time, there were periods during um, this, um, these last 11,000 years, but of course climates did change. It did climate change quite substantially, and sometimes with quite significant effects. And you can see just uh, an example um, down here, the Little Ice Age in Europe and China in the 16th and 17th century, which is a very good illustration of what I think is an important point to bear in mind, that humans operate within a Goldilocks zone. You know, we, we uh, function within a relatively narrow bound of comfortable and familiar conditions. Not too hot, not too cold, not too dry, not too wet. And when we deviate from those conditions, um, the effects can be quite severe, as they were in Europe and China during this period of the so-called Equal Ice Age. This shows um, London in 1683, the ice fairs that were set up on the Thames. Um, it really was a considerable change over a period of 30 or 40 years in, in local climates. Um, now, the, it, this had effects, serious effects for humans, apart from providing ice rinks down downtown London. Um, and that was particularly uh, supplies of food, that um, agriculture sagged, that um, crops failed, and there were significant effects uh, as a consequence of these changes in climate. Um, here um, is a slightly busy slide, but it shows life expectancy at birth um, from 1750, when formal, um, got relatively reliable statistics were just available up to <coughs> And I'd like you to just have a look at the, at the line for Sweden, which is um, the blue one here. But Sweden had good statistics before almost anybody else did. Um, and you'll see that what happens if you follow the line is that life expectancy gradually improved. <laughs> um, but it became much less variable. The graph to begin with jumps <coughs> all over the place. And then in more recent times, the trend is a far more regular. What that reflects is that humans were subject to so-called mortality crises. That there were uh, factors that caused mortality to soar uh, very rapidly. And one of those factors uh, was famine. And um, the, the um, trough that you see there in the 1770s, during this period of the Little Ice Age, was a consequence of severe famine within Sweden uh, during the, 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 the land Climate um, and poor health have been associated more frequently, more regularly, more recently. Um, this is a picture of uh, people curing for famine relief in Bangalore um, in 1877. Um, a whole book was written about this particular famine by a fellow called Mike Davis. It was a dreadful event that caused hundreds of thousands of deaths. And it was a consequence of the failure of the South Indian monsoon, which meant that the rain would come to India, uh, or usually does, and as a consequence. Over the course of several years, crops failed and people were hungry. Uh, there were, uh, as I said, hundreds of thousands of deaths. Not helped by British colonial regime, which um, put the priority on uh, exports. And so throughout the time of period, uh, India was exporting wheat to Great Britain. So uh, my point to you um, is that uh, climate has been important. Um, as an influence on humans ever since our species emerged. 
that shifting away from the Goldilocks zone in terms of um, kind of optimums has resulted in the past uh, in hunger, disease, suffering throughout human history. And then the third point I wanted to make is the one about the narrowness of that band. Um, so this is the Holocene, and again, just to remind you that through this period, when modern civilizations emerged, um, temperatures varied around the world by plus or minus one degree. It was a period of relative climate constancy. And now, what we're concerned about is what's happening at the extreme right-hand end of that graph, uh, and where we might be heading out of that comfort zone. Because um, what we're facing is um, a tragedy of global commons. The atmosphere uh, doesn't, isn't owned by anybody in particular. Everybody uses it. And therefore, in a sense, nobody in particular uh, feels any responsibility or liability for uh, damage or degradation in this common space. And yet, that's what's happening as a consequence of our activity, and in particular, our profligate use of fossil fuels. And here's a diagram that just makes that point, that um, greenhouse gas emissions occur in a variety of ways, whether we're talking about deforestation, uh, the enormous fires that are raging at the moment in Indonesia, for example, um, or uh, industrial activity, um, such as the use of <coughs> gases that are also <coughs> very potent um, climate warming agents, motor vehicles, we've talked about them, and of course other sources of so-called greenhouse gases, that is the chemical property of traffic heat. Now, um, the amount uh, uh, that we as humans are responsible for putting into that limited space, the global commons, the atmosphere, is absolutely enormous. And I think Simon said, once you get beyond trillions, it's rather difficult to know how many zeros there are and what to call it. And so this number at the top is roughly the number of kilograms of carbon dioxide uh, that are put into the atmosphere each year. And it's got a term that I keep forgetting what it is. Um, so I've converted it into another unit, which I call the ET. It's not the ET that you might have in mind. Um, it's this ET, uh, the Eiffel Tower. So uh, you think of three million Eiffel Towers of carbon being put into the atmosphere every year uh, to give you a sense of just what the scale of the pollution might be. And as a consequence, all the natural systems that operate uh, around the planet are overloading. They can't cope with this extent of pollution. And so what we're facing um, is that carbon dioxide levels are now on the way up they're rising higher than they get at any time in geological time, recent geological time. You can see in this graph um, reconstructions of what carbon dioxide levels were in the atmosphere going back half a million years. And there's this pattern of uh, rise and fall associated with glaciation in ice ages. Um, but the, what's happened in the last 150 years uh, is way out of kilter. It's the red line there. Uh, and of course this graph is a little bit out of date because we're now over 400. Uh, we're right up at the top of the scale. Now, it's not surprising as a consequence that the world is warm. Um, and uh, this is a graph from the IPCC report the government of climate change its report, its last uh, assessment, AR5, um, which is looking at where temperatures have gone in the last 100 years uh, and where we would have expected them to be in the absence of all those Eiffel towers with the carbon in the atmosphere. Um, if you just look at, um, at this bit of the graph down here, you can see there's a blank line and that shows where temperatures have gone. So the planet is warmer. <coughs> The blue zone, blue, purple zone here, is where we would have expected temperatures to go if there had not been that addition of carbon to the atmosphere. <coughs> you can see that so-called natural forcings explain 
much of what has happened over the last hundred years, but they do not explain the recent rise. The pink uh, zone shows what we would have expected if we took account, take account of that forces and uh, the human emissions. And you can see there's a very good fit. And it's on that basis that, um, that the IPC see through this conclusion that it's extremely likely the human influence got the cause of risk warming. IPCC, very cautious scientific organization, extremely likely means 99% certain. Now, of course, there are many environmental issues that we face. Uh, and so a very reasonable question that you might ask is, um, how much priority should we give this compared to the <coughs> other things that are of um, I was um, very struck by a lecture that Jan Wright gave. From those, for those of you not from New Zealand, Jan is the parliamentary commissioner of the environment. This is a, an office that New Zealand has. I think it's a, um, it's a very forward-thinking and um, valuable position uh, that we've established. This is somebody who is an independent of governor, who is a partner, who is a watchdog. That's their job, basically, to keep an eye on what's happening in the environment. And Jan is the incumbent um, who gave a lecture uh, last year on the question of um, what the environment, what matters most. And I thought she gave it a rather interesting um, personal touch. She framed it in terms of what keeps me awake at night? What are the things that I bother me? And here is the thing. She, she worries about an environmental problem more if it can't be reversed. She worries about something that's accumulated, building over time. She worries about problems that are large scale, pervasive rather than localized. Also, things that are accelerating. Is, um, is rising. And lastly, where there's a likelihood or a risk of things of um, change crossing thresholds. She then went on to say there was one problem that fitted all these criteria, and she devoted the rest to the lecture. It's climate change. Now this is uh, the IPCC report estimating or looking at where we may be going in the future, uh, looking at four different pathways uh, under different uh, assumptions. Uh, on the vertical axis, this, that's the global average temperature. I might just remind you that with the Holocene, we were talking about one degree of warming as the maximum that's been observed over this last 39 years. One degree is right down the bottom of this graph. Now, climate change is not irreversible, but there's so much momentum in the system that it can take a very long time to turn it around. And that's evident if you look at the bottom of these scenarios, uh, which is the most hopeful one and the only one that leads to us keeping warming within two degrees. And you can see, as I described to you here, a better than 50% chance means lowering greenhouse gas emissions by 47% within the next 20 years, and going to, to, to zero or near zero by the end of the century. So not irreversible, but very difficult to turn around. In terms of where we're heading in the future, this is the high-end <coughs> scenario. Um, talking about large-scale pervasive change. Uh, this, assuming virtually no restriction on uh, use of carbon fuels, has us heading towards 12 degrees warmer, which we certainly a very, uh, very large-scale change. What about the rate of change? Well, if we look at emissions, uh, the decade-on-decade uh, decade increase in uh, greenhouse emissions globally 
graphs are rising year, decade on decade. Um, the rate of increase is shown here, particularly in the last 10 years um, as a consequence of renaissance of coal. What about the rate of change of temperatures? Well, this might be the most important graph of all because of, of course humans are very adaptable um, and the basic constraint on how successfully we can adapt to change is how quickly change occurs. What stands out if we look at the projections for warming compared with what's happened in the past is that the rate of change is absolutely increasing. There have been two occasions in the last 60 million years when the world warmed by about four degrees. And that's where we're heading in the physics as usual scenario. But what's different about the previous episodes is that they occurred over thousands or tens of thousands of years, whereas we're looking at changes that may be occurring in the space of centuries. So remember Jan Wright's thought, what do I worry about? I worry about things that change quickly. This certainly fits the bill. What about this point of um, crossing thresholds? Well, we certainly are seeing step changes in some ecosystems across the already. And here's an example of work uh, that I've been doing with Chinese colleagues looking at the effects of climate change on health in China. Um, and the point of China, the part of China where change is occurring most critical is actually the Tibet. So we've been looking at uh, climate and health here in the plateau, and here is Lhasa, which you would be aware of, is very high up, um, way up in the sky. And what's interesting is that as well as it getting a whole lot warmer in Lhasa, um, which is higher than they've ever been, we've seen some significant changes. And we've looked at the arrival of mosquitoes in Lhasa, which end up with our established in Lhasa. That's important from a health point of view, because these are vectors for significant diseases which the populations have no experience of in the past. We think that, uh, along with other changes, the environment in Lhasa has suddenly become suitable for these vectors, for these vectors, for these pests so that God is not being there So these are the first of the three points that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the, I think an important uh, point to bear in mind is that um, adaptation, we are very adaptive, <coughs> but we do face limits. Because one response to climate change, um, and I've heard Bill English say it actually, uh, is that it makes sense, that given the huge costs of trying to stop a campaign, um, to simply wait and see what's delivered our way, and then cope as best we can. Now that's short-sighted, because there are some <coughs> hard limits on how well we can adapt. Uh, food, I mentioned the importance of food. Here's another graph from the IPCC report looking at the effects of warming on crop yields. Wheat, really important state of crop, um, is probably the most sensitive to rising temperatures. And this graph shows what we expect to happen in tropical areas as the world warms. And as you can see, the wheat yields are going to fall. Now the blue line shows the food scientists' best estimates of what we'll be able to achieve by adaptation. So that means choice of you know, cultivars, irrigation, uh, other ways of protecting crops in order to make them protected. And you can see that makes a difference, but it's not going to make enough of a difference. And as a consequence, the IPC has concluded that if we head in this direction, we're going to face absolutely immense pressure on our food security. Even rich countries, though, um, face limits. Uh, sea level rise means that we're going to see an exponential increase in the frequency of severe flooding events. And this is a graph that makes this point, talking about London, the Thames Barrier that was established to cope with a one in a thousand year event. Um, with 
sea level rise of a metre, that one in a thousand year event will be a one in a ten year. And it's very difficult to see how London will be protected by facing um, absolutely overwhelming flooding of that extent so frequently in the future. So I say, I'm suggesting here that even the health of wealthiest of countries is going to be increased. Now, human physiology, by the way, has got some hard limits as well. Um, and uh, we've been doing, we're looking at heat tolerance. Um, now, um, because we're warm-blooded animals, uh, we need to stay in a quite narrow range of whole body temperature in order to function. And uh, this is a graph showing how much you can work as the temperature rises, as the temperature rises, uh, the extent of the work um, diminishes, uh, depending on how uh, heavily you work, how fast you work, how hard you work. Um, and uh, this is applies regardless whether you're 20, 30, 40, 30, whether you're an Olympic athlete uh, or you're a sedentary potato. You are limited by how quickly you can discharge it. And, uh, this has very practical implications. Uh, sporting events, for example, um, outdoor sporting events generally are uh, cancelled if we get it about 28 degrees, using the metric for low temperature. Uh, heavy work, like heavy agricultural work, is not possible once you get up to about 36 degrees for cold low temperature. And if you go right to the end of the graph, uh, over here, um, it's not possible to stay in heat balance even if you're sitting under a tree in Greece. Now you might say that sounds extreme. That sounds like science fiction. It becomes so hot that the parts of the planet are essentially uninhabitable. But in fact, we're not so far away. At <coughs> the end of July this year, there was an unprecedented heat wave in the Middle East. I've seen stories on it. And there was a place in um, the south of Iran, uh, near the Arab Gulf, where it reached 38 degrees, wet bulb growth temperature. So the air temperature is about 46, and about 47% runs of humidity. Uh, the Arab Gulf is now heating up to over 30 degrees um, in the hot part of the year. And that part of the world has a consequence that's extraordinarily muggy and humid. So, these are not um, absolutely implausible conditions, but the projections are, if we keep getting in the same direction, parts of the world in which people cannot function because it is simply too hot uh, are going to become more and more extensive. Now, I don't want to depress you all absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to just talk for five minutes or so about opportunities, because I think this is a really important uh, story. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to face some significant choices, some very important decisions are going to be made, and I hope we'll make wise decisions, not this kind of decision. Um, I don't know if you saw this in the news recently, um, this is Governor Bill Walker from Alaska, <laughs> who says, um, the state is uh, facing enormous problems with climate change, sea level rise, ice melting. Um, in order to cope with this, they need to drill oil in the Arctic. <laughs> This seems to me to be an unwise decision. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other opportunities, and both um, Simon and Julianne mentioned this one, which is a favorite of mine. We know that transport is responsible for over a quarter of greenhouse emissions in this sector, which is rising most quickly in terms of its contributions of greenhouse gas emissions, along with all the other issues that Simon and Julianne talked about. And here's an opportunity for getting some early health gains from wise climate moves. Um, we, the group of us did some arithmetic. We said 
we are. <coughs> what would happen if we were able to shift just 5% of short uh, trips from cars, bicycles, and Zealand? And of course, most urban car trips are short. The high proportion of them are only in five, six, seven kilometers, well within cycling range. And so maybe if we just shift five percent, one in twenty of those bicycles, what would it do? It, it would save us immediately over twenty million liters of fuel. So an enormous, well, enormous, uh, significant um, gain in terms of. Um, fuel costs and emissions. Now, if we did nothing about the roads, did none of the sorts of things that Simon was talking about in terms of making active transport safer and more attractive, there would be some um, costs in terms of more injuries, uh, more road crash deaths. We there might be an extra fine for road crash deaths. But look at the positive side, you know, uh, there would be, uh, we estimated, over 120 deaths a year uh, postponed as a consequence of being fitter, just as a result of being more active more often. Uh, and uh, Julianne talked about the fact that we don't often take into account these disbenefits in terms of the economic impacts. We estimated that um, this move would save New Zealand about $200 million <coughs> in health costs. So, an example of uh, an opportunity to do something that would be good for our health and well-being and for our economy and would have um, important uh, health benefits at the same time. Looking overseas, there are many other opportunities, I believe. Take this one, um, indoor air pollution. In many parts of the world, uh, people are reliant on these fires, burning wood, straw, so in their homes in order to cook or provide heat. And India is a very good example. We know um, that the indoor air pollution coming from the use of biomass causes about 500,000 deaths. It also contributes a sizable proportion of a uh, non trivial proportion of India's greenhouse gas emissions. We know what to do here. The, uh, Use of smokeless stoves has been trial, works. There are many opportunities to avoid this particular health hazard and at the same time do something wise about climate risks. A couple of years ago, um, the new climate economy report was released. This was an attempt to look at a big scale, the opportunities for co benefits, <coughs> and the conclusions reached by people like Nicholas Stern and others was that we could get a long way towards holding emissions to two degrees, um, to the two degree trajectory, by putting in place sensible economic policies that would have other benefits at the same time. And so the conclusion there, as you can see, um, the opportunity to build lasting economic growth at the same time as reducing the immense risks of climate change. Well, which kind of a path does New Zealand follow? Um, you'll recognise um, <coughs> this comment that the Prime Minister made and others in government that New Zealand is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of global emissions. Um, and <coughs> who wants to be a world leader? <laughs> it makes much more sense to be a fast follower. And I think this, these two thoughts, that we don't really contribute very much on the world stage, and anyway it's not in our best interests to be up front in terms of dealing with this problem, are conditioning the kinds of responses that we make. And my argument to you is that uh, this uh, is mistaken and is risking uh, that we run the risk that we miss is the risk of First of all, is New Zealand producing a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of emissions? Well, it depends whether you talk about total or per person. Per capita, New Zealand is quite right near the top, just as it is on the obesity. And we face this, you know, risk really of being seen to be quite critical, described in this country uh, 
price adjustment, but we are not a big source of the problem. But other people, like India, uh, they are the ones who should be taking action. India generates about two tons per person per year. New Zealand is probably well over 10. And the other point about um, you know, not wishing to be a world leader, um, rather being a fast follower, which means, I assume, that we'd be perfectly happy to come second on Sunday morning, uh, uh, <laughs> means that we risk losing significant opportunities. Uh, and the move to distributed renewable energy sources is just one example where companies that, and countries that don't recognize where they're heading and act quickly uh, are going to risk falling, falling away behind. I have a son who's working in Shanghai um, on solar panels, working with a company that makes flexible solar panels for rural schools. China is pouring money into the development of renewable energy sources including these remarkable technologies that get printed. We print it onto cloth um, and uh, used in uh, all kinds of uh, opportunities, all kinds of places. Uh, Tim Grosser has decided, or has announced, the government's um, target for, for Paris uh, in December. It's about 11% cut on greenhouse emissions compared with 1990. Another question is, how would you judge that? Is it uh, a, a target that is a reasonable one? Is it a target that's an uh, adequate one? There's a, a website that you can go to called Climate Action Track. Um, it's a group of climate scientists, many of them involved with the IPCC, who have attempted to judge um, the quality of these national targets. Looking at them in this way, um, if everybody did what you suggest is a reasonable target, where would we be? Um, so looking at the New Zealand target, if everybody did what New Zealand is proposing to do, how much of a difference would that make to the face of the planet? And they divided in the, the um, responses into um, inadequate, medium, sufficient, and role model on the basis of where we would go if every country took the approach that this particular country is suggesting. <clears throat> on the left here, you can see where New Zealand sits. Now, there's only one country actually that um, qualified as a law model climate action tracker uh, rankings, and it was Butan. But um, the European Union is not far behind. And I thought I'd just finish by um, returning to the bicycle motif. Because Denmark really is a country that I believe uh, is a role model in many ways uh, for us in New Zealand. And, uh, their uptake of <coughs> energy sources, they went from zero to hero in terms of their development of wind technology. And when it comes to bicycles, of course, they also provide a model. And so I loved it when I came across this picture um, that included a bicycle and a wind turbine in one place. So this is a, a, a group in Copenhagen who made these wonderful bikes. And this one, has got um, it's a cargo bike with a wind turbine here, uh, and it's got a motor and battery. So the idea is that you can draw on wind to help you ride. You can't see it, but it also has solar panels. <laughs> so here I suggest to you as an example of uh, an opportunity well taken. 